Kevin. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, see if I can see the board. Maybe I better come right out here. And thank you, Lori, for inviting me. Uh, Francis, thank you for that talk. Uh, I'm going to have to do something special in order to keep up with you. Uh, Bink, thank you for organizing this wonderful conference and uh, your leadership uh, in the field and uh, all of these wonderful symposia that I've had the pleasure of uh, participating in. And uh, uh, you're a real hero in, in our field. Well, we've heard a lot about uh, all these folded proteins, uh, how wonderful they are. But let me tell you, there's some more important proteins than folded proteins. And that's ones that are intrinsically disordered, so-called intrinsically disordered proteins, or IDPs, or IDPRs, uh, regions in which they're unfolded. Because they like water more than they like themselves. Uh, and so, let's see. Here's an, in, oops. Here's an intrinsically disordered protein in water because the side chains actually prefer to interact with water more than they do to make a hydrophobic core to fold. The importance of this field is that an enormous number of viral proteins that are IDPs, that are natively unfolded like this one. And they do terrible damage to us when they hit targets and allow viruses to kill us. And so we need to understand uh, how to actually uh, figure out the structures of unfolded proteins, how their dynamics are, and how they make little folded pieces when they tr target the uh, ribosomes and things like that and viruses that kill us. Uh, so this area is one that I've been studying recently. Uh, and in order to uh, give you an introduction to this with, by the way, Bink, I put lots of water molecules in this slide just for you, just so that I'm okay here in this nature of water business. What I'm gonna tell you about today is how we've developed over the years methods, laser methods, basically, uh, to study uh, the dynamics of, of unfolded proteins, so-called IDPs or IDPRs. And I'll finish up with our recent work on COVID proteins that are killing us all and how maybe we can stop them. So we started with this. Pernilla just gave a wonderful talk, and uh, we started uh, figuring out how to study uh, unfolded systems by uh, studying protein folding from unfolded proteins to folded proteins, and we started with cytochrome C. The interesting thing, Aria, about cytochrome C is that when it's unfolded in water, with water molecules all around, the ligands always change. The native ligands are never there in the unfolded states <clears throat> because the, thi the thioether that's in the nice hydrophobic environment uh, pops out when you unfold a protein and it gets a hard ligand that likes to interact more with water. So you get a water, you get a histidine ligand, a nematozole here in the unfolded form that interacts more with water and and ends up being a very negative potential, and very hard to reduce, and very poor electron transfer agents. If you trigger the folding by some mechanism, you get a compact structure, but not folded, which is full of water molecules. And the rate-limiting step of folding the system is almost always ligation, the change of the histidine misligated form at iron into the methionine, and that's the rate limiting step. But it's not the, la it's not the last rate limiting step. The, ra the last rate limiting step is the water expulsion because in the folded protein, water is still trapped inside, and to squeeze that all out takes a lot of time. So uh, you can see the protein fold by optical methods, usually by absorption methods or by Raman spectroscopy, lots of methods to study this 
process of folding the protein to get to a high potential protein because the, now the iron is encased in a hydrophobic environment where the potential now is very high. It wants to be reduced from iron plus three with a positive charge inside to iron plus two where it's neutral inside where the hydrophobic encapsulation is much stronger. So the potential shoots up from this very negative thing to a very positive one. And only here is this protein functional. So how do we study this? Well, first of all, for Aria, I thought I would show him the range of potentials in heme proteins from minus 400 millivolts in the formal potential all the way up to plus 400. Aria probably can explain all this to you in, in terms that uh, you might not understand, uh, but Ari understands. Uh, and if you stay with him long enough, he'll explain it to you. Uh, but Aria, most of this is uh, down here in these systems, these are almost always in contact with water. But as you squeeze the water out and get more and more hydrophobic encapsulation, you get to extremely high potentials. So there's water associated with this big change in potential going from uh, very negative ones to very positive ones. And as I said before, when it's iron plus three, it's very easily unfolded because water is in there. If it's iron plus two with a hydrophobic interior, it's very hard to unfold cytochrome C. So there is a big gap. There's a big gap in the unfolding curve right here where the difference between an unfolded protein and a folded protein is one electron. One electron kicked into this system right here in this region will trigger the folding on a very fast time scale. So the first thing we did in our lab is to develop a technique, laser techniques, to trigger protein folding and study it. And uh, here are the laser triggers. We can excite, uh, we can do two photon excitation of NADH and kick out an electron quickly and hydrate electron. We can do rubipi, we can do all kinds of cobalt things. So we have a bunch of laser triggered electron transfer reagents that we can shoot an electron into an unfolded protein and trigger its folding immediately. And we've done that. Pernilla was involved in a lot of this and she claims she has the world's record uh, for the fastest folded protein and I will verify that that's actually true. Uh, so Pernilla, you can relax. Uh, so uh, Pernilla did this experiment with another protein because this one's much, much slower. Cytochrome C, you triggered an electron in here with a laser trigger it immediately collapses into a compact structure with still a lot of water in it. And then uh, the ligands exchange to get the native ligands, and that's a rate limiting step, which is a few milliseconds. A few milliseconds, it gets to what looks like a folded structure. But it's not quite exactly folded, Laurie. It still has a little water in it. And the final end play is getting a last bits of water out of it. And that sometimes takes minutes, in some cases even hours, before you get a final native folded protein. Uh, a lot of theoreticians have been interested in the speed limit of protein folding. Pernilla showed you that she could, her world record is a microsecond for folding. But the theoretician says it could go back, you could be eclipsed, Pernilla, because the world record could go to 100 nanoseconds. That's predicted by theoreticians. We thought we would check that uh, by labeling a protein with a donor that we'd, we could excite with a laser to, to then have diffusion. What, what, how long does it take to make the first native contact? And we measured that by uh, laser-induced electron transfer from a donor to an acceptor that we put in. And when we, to get the speed limit, the, the fastest you could possibly fold a protein. And the theoreticians were right. The fastest thing we got was around 100 nanoseconds with uh, working with label uh, 
cytochrome C and working with uh, tryptophan and nitrotyrosine labeled alpha synuclein, the Parkinson's protein that, the, that Pernilla talked about. Here's the theoretical uh, prediction of this contact rate and goes into this inverted thing. When you have a short contact, it's very hard sterically to get the two together, but when it's a little longer, they can collide rapidly. So this, we experimentally verified that the, the folding speed limit is 100 nanoseconds. So vanilla, you st still have a factor of 10 to go to get to the result. So now, after these experiments, here's the picture of protein folding dynamics. You have an unfolded protein, you interchange the fusion you can make in 100 nanoseconds. Then you've got to do ligand substitution to get the right ligands in because the wrong ligands are in water, the right ligands are in the folded protein, and that's, that comes about in about milliseconds. Uh, and then you have to get water loss. The final play is getting all the water out of this in the folded protein to make it na native. In order to study that, we developed a laser-induced method. M many people do fluorids, fluorescence energy transfer, steady state stuff. But that doesn't do any good for us. We have to have a much faster method. And that's time-resolved fret. That's using a femtosecond laser to excite a system and use a, a picosecond street camera to collect picosecond snapshots of the protein as it's moving around. So we can freeze it in time with picosecond to nanosecond laser snapshots. And then we could use electron transfer, another method, to study the diffusion problem of how fast these snapshots are making back and forth. How much time do I have? You just held up something. No, you're good. Is my time, uh, is my time is up already? No, you have plenty of time. I'm okay, Lori? Lori, will you tell me when I have about five minutes to go? And then I can really speed up. I can, I can go as fast as 100 nanoseconds. <laughs> okay, here's what we do, folks. Pay attention now, Ari. Uh, what we do is uh, we label um, uh, proteins with a, a, a donor that we can excite with a laser pulse, a femtosecond laser pulse. And we can collect uh, picosecond snapshots. And uh, in the folded protein, in the folded protein, this, uh, uh, this will be very, very sharp distance that we get out of first or energy transfer and a very, very fast quenching. When we unfold it and we look at unfolded structures fluctuating, we get a very broad distribution of distances, which we can deconvolute by a method uh, that we use with exponentials that we call a, a minimum entropy. And then this has a very broad uh, decay, a multi-exponential decay from all these different equilibrating conformations of this intrinsically disordered protein. So we've studied that in cytochrome C by labeling a whole bunch of uh, residues at these positions with dancel groups, with dyes, these green dyes. And our acceptor, we excite these with a femtosecond laser and then Energy transfer goes into the heme acceptor, which has broad absorption. And then we, we collect these picosecond to nanosecond snapshots, and we will literally watch these conformations fold into the final protein by taking these snapshots. Here is the distribution of conformations from time resolved fret in the unfolded state from these positions, the one closest to the heme has a, a distribution of distances that's pretty close to the folded form, but the ones out earlier have ex very extended structures that we can see in this time resolve fret. Then uh, we can start the folding. One millisecond, 10 milliseconds. This is, these, are the, these are the nanosecond snapshots that you're seeing as the protein is folding. Finally going to the folded state, which uh, has everything right around the, uh, the folded form and these narrow things. But of course, there's still dynamics. So it's not one distance. It, there's still dynamics in the folded proteins. So you see this distribution. There are also still some uh, uh, 
extended conformations that are left, and that's because there's still water in these systems. At the so-called end of the folding, there's still some water in there that has to be squeezed out, and that takes minutes to hours, finally, to get this thing fully folded. But th this time resolved these snapshots, and the electron transfer to get the diffusional problem are, are the methods that we've developed to study these intrinsically disordered proteins. So here's the, here's the conclusion. Once you trigger the folding, the intra-chain diffusion takes place in 100 nanoseconds. That's the first, furthest native contacts are formed in 100 nanoseconds. Then you get an equilibrium distribution of compact and extended polypeptides that are interconverting on the microsecond time scale, according to our electron transfer work. And finally, you get to the folded protein where the, go back, where the, oops, where the ligand substitution occurs at about here, but the water loss keeps going, uh, finally squeezing the water out to get the native form takes sometimes hours. So water is very, very important in this whole business from beginning to end in, in this system. And so now we're going to apply these methods to study an intrinsically disordered protein called alpha-synuclein, which is the protein that causes Parkinson's disease. So understanding this unfolded structure is very important. In, the, uh, in, in water solution, the unfolded form is in great concentration and equilibrium. There's only a bit of the folded form in, in water solution. If you put this intrinsically disordered protein on a surface, like a micellular surface, it, it folds immediately into the, this thing that finally becomes a toxic form. It becomes, as Pranilla showed, these fibrils after a long period of time. We have studied this uh, unfolded, intrinsically disordered protein by the techniques that I told you about, namely by uh, electro time resolved electron transfer. What we do is we use the tryptophan donor. We have we put in tryptophanes by mutagenesis. We put in tyrosines and we nitrate them with tetranitromethane as the acceptor. So the singlet of tryptophan, which we excite initially, which is very short-lived, uh, does time-resolved uh, energy transfer. We come down this route uh, here, and this gives us, the singlet gives us the picosecond and nanosecond snapshots of these structures. The electron transfer work that we do from the triplet, there, there's also a triplet tryptophan that lives for a long time, and we can use that triplet to transfer electrons to tyrosine, and we can come down this to find out how fast these, these conformations of this intrinsically disordered protein interchange. And that, those numbers are here, they're in hundreds of nanoseconds. At these, at these places, determined by uh, time-resolved energy transfer. So this combination of techniques, picosecond and nanosecond snapshots of structures that are fluctuating, but we can freeze them with these very fast techniques. And then with electron transfer, we can watch how fast they're interconverting. We're the only lab in the world that does these two things together. Uh, to have a whole picture of not only the picosecond snapshots, but also the interchain diffusion uh, system so we can map it all out. And here are the results. In these different positions, you always get a distribution of, of extended conformations uh, like these, extended conformations and compact conformations from these methods. And if you look at the extended conformation that we tease out of this system, it looks like this. And this is what the uh, electron transfer picture looks like for the uh, interchain dynamics. For example, this end contacts this end right here faster than uh, this part contacts this end. And so in the, in the, in the loop size versus contact rate, and, and, and usually in microseconds, uh, we get this behavior, and then it comes back up, 
because this end is closer to this end and this end is closer to this end. So we, we can map out this whole system this way in the diffusional dynamics. This is, this is one of the snapshot structures and this is, uh, this is how fast they interchange at uh, different loop sizes. So this is our picture of alpha-synuclein, the Parkinson's protein from these two techniques. And then we can find where copper, Pernilla told you how important copper is. Copper is very important in Parkinson's disease and we need to know exactly where it binds. But using tryptophan fluorescence, copper quenches that by electron transfer. So we can put in tryptophanes all through this system and find out where the copper binds. And that's where it binds. It, surprisingly, it binds at the end terminus because we get total quenching of the tryptophan fluorescence, the singlet quenching, at this and only this position. We put in tryptophanes everywhere else, there's no quenching. It's all here, surprisingly, although there are histidines all over this thing. The copper doesn't bind there, Penilla. It binds in the end terminus and, and amide bonding. So we have mapped out all of this stuff in alpha synuclein. And so with that now, I'll go to the main event, which is how do we use these techniques to study intrinsically disordered proteins that are, all viral proteins are loaded with intrinsically disordered proteins. And they're the ones that do the damage to us. They're the ones that kill us. So we've got to figure out how to kill them. We got to figure out how to nail these intrinsically disordered proteins that, that plug up our ribosomes, prevent translation from our immune system to studying the virus. And this is one of the key ones. Non-structural protein one, NSP1. This binds to the 40S ribosome. It blocks the RNA, nRNA entry channel prevents protein translation. It prevents our immune system from fighting the virus. The unstructured protein, when it hits uh, the ribosome, it makes this little cork, this little alpha helical cork that plugs up the entry channel and prevents our immune system from firing, uh, fighting the virus. So the goal in my group is to kill off this stupid protein and get rid of this damn thing uh, so that we can have our immune system fighting the virus. Uh, we're metal chemists. Uh, uh, we like to fight everything with metal ions. So there's a histidine right in here, very close to the alpha helix that is the cork. So we want to, we want to destroy the cork uh, by designing, and we, we'll design these things, Francis. I know you don't like design, but to hell with that, we're gonna design this thing. Uh, and then, you, then you're gonna feel better about chemists. Good luck. Yeah, she said good luck. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I, I hear you. <laughs> and what you're gonna see is, we ain't done it yet, <laughs> but we're on the way. Okay, so that's what we've got here. So here's the problem that I've been talking about, is target, targeting intrinsically disordered proteins. The problem with this is the, they're called IDPs and IDPRs. Traditional structure-based discovery methods is not an option. That's not an option because if you have an enzyme that you want to target and you know the active site structure, you can design uh, inhibitors to target that. But this is a fluctuating, intrinsically disordered protein that's moving around with all kinds of conformations. You have no clue how to target that thing by the traditional pharma methods. So uh, we've got to figure out how to do that in this system. So we've got to figure out what the, what the region around the cork is like uh, by these methods that we're going to use by TR, TR fret. And uh, the dynamics, dynamics are going to be probed by electron transfer from excited triplet tryptophan to a nitrotyrosine, as we demonstrated um, with, uh, alpha, with our work on alpha synuclein. So here we go. 
Here we go. This is what we got to be. Uh, when it binds to the ribosome here, right in this region, it makes this, it, it does fold. When it hits a ribosome, it folds to this little cork, this little alpha helical cork right here. So this is the region we've got to target. And our target is about uh, a dissociation constant is probably in the low nanomolar because we're competing with a binding, the cork binding here to the ribosome is about one to two uh, micromolar. So in order to compete effectively with that, we've got to have something in the nanomolar range. So that's a big order. So let's look at it carefully. Here's what the cork looks like. Here's the region of the cork. Here's the histidine we're going to target that we think we can target this with metal complexes. And if we can disrupt this region, we can disrupt the cork. This is the entire linker method and the entire C terminal area. This is all intrinsically disordered uh, until, until it hits the target. So we're going to use what I've been talking about, time resolve fret. The fret pair we're going to use is tryptophan nitrotyrosine, where the first length is 26 angstrom. We'd like it to be bigger, but this isn't a great fret pair. It's 26 angstroms, which, we, which means we can look at distances up to 40 angstroms. But that's enough for this system in the C terminus. So here's our results of our long series of TRF fret experiments. Here's the uh, tryptophan decay uh, uh, rapidly. And here's the multi-exponential tryptophan decay when, the, when we have a, a tyrosine, uh, a tryptophan here and a nitrotyrosine here. In this folded structure in the cork, this is 13 angstroms. So in our time resolve fret measurements, which is multi-exponential here, we start with about 20 exponentials. And then uh, we fit it, of course, beautifully with 20 exponentials. So then, then with algorithms, you take it down to what's the minimum number of exponentials can you fit this thing? And the answer is three. And one of them is right around the folded form. So it's likely that in this fluctuating disordered structure, a small percentage is already ready like the cork. And the other two are extended. These are extended confirmation. And one is very, very extended. And the answer is copper binds. Copper binds to this histidine uh, pretty tightly in the micromolar range. This is from excited tryptophan to copper two electron transfer. We can, we can determine exactly the binding of, of copper to this histidine uh, at 6.5 pH. And uh, it looks something like this at 7.5 TH. We've done a lot of EPR work. This is CV work, uh, simple EPR. But we've done a lot of pulsed EPR. We've done indoor and XDOR and all kinds of uh, high score and all the pulse techniques. But the answer is, this is what the site looks like at pH 7.5 in this protein. It's got three nitrogens. The histidine is here. Then it's got stuff from the peptides that are deprotonated. And it looks like the prion octa-repeat almost exactly in this binding site from our EPR work. And then, of course, now we, nobody's going to feed, uh, feed you just copper. Copper is not going to help you because it's going to be picked up everywhere. You can't just start guggling drinking copper sulfate. Don't do that, Francis. We're going to have to have a copper complex that is very specific for this particular site. And we've now figured out by all of these methods, time resolve fret and electron transfer methods, roughly what this site looks like as it's fluctuating. Uh, so we're starting to design chelates now that will be very specific for this site. And uh, the one that looks the most promising is copper 2 IDA. Uh, copper 2, it's imidinodiacetate, has an NH here, 
uh, which we can derivatize, and it binds to uh, this, uh, this site in the, in the C terminus, in this histidine site, it binds like this according to our, our spectroscopic methods. And so now we can derivatize this and put hydrophobic groups like claws out into the protein and go through uh, a number of, let me see if I've got that. Yeah, here. There, here are the ones that we're, this is amino diacetate, and so we can derivatize it, uh, this simply by alkyl halides, and put in our, our groups here. So we can put all kinds of charged groups and hydrophobic groups and so forth that will reach into the protein. That's where we are now to make a selective inhibitor. What we want to do is make an inhibitor of the inhibitor. Uh, the inhibitor is killing us, and we want to inhibit the inhibitor. And if you got, if, if, Bink, if you've got a good name for that, please tell me, <laughs> because I don't want to say inhibitor, inhibitor every time. Uh, but right now we've got the structure that looks like this at the site. Uh, it's not, it's now in the low micromolar range. We've got to have a little more binding. We've got to have another factor of 10 binding in order to be in the region where uh, we actually inhibit the cork, corking up the 40S ribosome. So we're well on the way to that right now. Uh, we're, we're, you know, I always have to do computational analysis. I'm going to need your help, Ari, so uh, I hope you're willing to help me on this. Uh, I, uh, I need help on all of these things. I may need you for some of this, Francis, but... Uh, I don't think Frances is going to help me because she doesn't like design. Notice design is here in synthesis. But we're, we're going to design and synthesize a whole bunch of, a whole library of pot potential targets and go for it. And uh, we've also got a, we're now analyzing the copper two binding to the, the entire protein. We've been working only with the C-terminal part that's the business part that does this now because it's simpler to do that. But we, we, are, we have already shown now that the holoprotein does the same thing as the C-terminal part. So we're well along the way. Um, and so if we can get this done, uh, maybe, and, and it's not just COVID, it's essentially every virus. Essentially every virus has a protein like this that's doing damage that has, so this is a much bigger problem than just COVID. It's, it's all virus infections have unstructured regions like this that do damage on us. And so we've got, we've got to nail this problem somehow. I have a very small group. Uh, uh, it's interesting that Francis's group meets at the beach. My group meets in the bar. Uh, this is Lucky Baldwin's, a nice Irish pub close to campus. And uh, we meet, this is my little group, Dave, Jay Winkler, myself, and here's our little group with uh, a few folks now. Here are the, here's my group. Uh, Marianne Morales is the one, and pa Jay Winkler, the ones who've done. And Paul Oyala is our Pulse EPR guy. Uh, all of these people are working on now these viral, un intrinsically disordered protein projects. And so... Uh, I'm very happy that you stayed for this talk. Uh, usually people leave before this, uh, and you've stuck it out today. I'm very grateful for that. So thank you very much for your attention.